Hello, and welcome back to the BCR Dawson Sub. This update will cover work undertaken during January 2023. It's been a very productive month. I have some new bench work installed and some new track work laid and wired. So let's dive right in. The Highway 97 section has now been leveled with shims and secured in place with screws into the brackets. This was done prior to securing the shelf for the Fort St. John subdivision to the wall to ensure that I have a level transition between sections. The shelf for the Fort St. John subdivision was then secured to the wall with screws. Two of these screws were into concrete as my balcony is on the other side of the wall at this point, so a special bit and screws were required. The third screw was opposite the bedroom, so it went into a stud. Here we have the Highway 97 section, which is now being leveled and secured in place. We come down here, we can see the shim between the benchwork section and the bracket, which is helping to level it. And then underneath there, we have the screw, which comes up through the bracket into the benchwork to secure it in place. So you can see that it is now quite rigid and it's not going anywhere. Next to it, we have the shelf for the Fort St. John subdivision, which runs along the wall. This is secured in place with a biscuit joint to the rear shelf of the Highway 97 section. And then there are three screws that are attaching it to the wall along here. Then we have the section inside the wall. It's actually just sitting in there on top of the drywall, but with this section on this side and the septimus sections on the other side, it's not going anywhere, so we don't need to glue it in place. On the opposite side of the wall, preparations were made for installing the new benchwork sections for Septimus. A laser level was used to mark the top of the benchwork. A stud finder was then used to locate the studs into which the screws will be driven. Prior to installing the benchwork for Septimus, the two halves were bolted together. Biscuits were used to aid in aligning the sections. They were glued in on one side only, so that the sections can be separated at some point in the future if needed. The two sections were clamped together and then bolted together with carriage bolts, washers, and nuts. These are the same ones I used on previous sections of the layout. The bench work was propped up against the wall with sticks, and then it was shimmed up to the correct height. Screws were then driven into the studs along the top edge of the bench work. And that was followed up with another set of screws, which were driven into the studs along the bottom edge of the bench work. This view underneath the bench work at the joint between sections illustrates the carriage bolts and passage holes for the various bus wires. And speaking of those bus wires, as the bench work was going up, they were brought through the holes which had been drilled into the rear of the bench work. With the reverse curve into Septimus temporarily put in place, this is the view through the wall from the layout room. And this is the view from the bedroom side. The openings did not line up quite as I intended, so I will be adjusting this for a better appearance at some point. Here is the view of the benchwork for Septimus after installation as you walk into the bedroom with the LED lighting illuminated. The box on top is for a fast clock. And this is another view of the bench work for Septimus from across the room. At only six inches in width, it does not impair the function of the room, yet it provides a very important location for operations. So with the bench work installed, I set to work immediately on the track lane. The location for the reverse curve into Septimus was marked out in pencil, including the center line for laying the foam track bed. This is the foam track bed for the reverse curves as it is going down onto the benchwork. A portion of the track bed from the section inside the wall was glued onto the new benchwork and it was then cut for a tight joint between sections. Septimus has two sidings, so I used the three and a quarter inch wide track bed available from Woodland Scenics. This photograph shows the track bed for the south half of Septimus. And this view shows the north half with the track extending beyond the north switches to the end of the bench work. My track laying begins with marking the locations for the feeder wires on the track sections. 
I installed two pairs of feeder wires for each section of track. I remove the web between the ties where the feeder wires will go using a number 17 blade. With the track positioned on the layout, I transfer the location of the feeder wires onto the track bed using a Sharpie marker. I cut a slit at the location of the holes for the feeder wires so that the drill bit will not chew up the track bed. I then drill the holes for the feeder wires, starting with 5 ths then 1 8 and then 3 16th inch. This provides a countersink and a bit of wiggle room for the feeder wires as the track goes down into position. After drilling the holes, I clean them out with a round needle file so that the feeder wires will go down smoothly through the holes. The track sections are then removed from the layout and the feeder wires are soldered to the underside of the rails. Once the ballast is in place, they will not be seen. The track sections are then returned to the layout for a test fit with the feeder wires now fed through their holes. Here we see the reverse curve during a test fit with the feeder wires below. Prior to gluing down curves, I installed a super elevation. This has been assembled from thin layered strips of masking tape. The glue is then applied underneath the track. Very little of the foam tack glue is required to secure the track in place and it dries clear. Here is the reverse curve into Septimus after it has been secured in place. And here is the first test train to come through the wall. It is running on temporary DC power, which is flowing into these sections only through the rail joiners at this point. The next step in track laying at this location was to prepare for installation of the south switches. The turnouts were laid down on the track bed and the holes for the turnout throw wires and the frog feeder wires were drilled out. The throw wires require a quarter inch diameter hole and care needs to be taken to locate them accurately underneath the throw bar when centered. The frog feeder wires require a 1 8 inch hole, same as the track feeders. The next step is to prepare and install the turnouts for the south end of Septimus siding. This is an Atlas Code 55 number 7 turnout, and it requires a few modifications prior to installation on the layout. The first modification is to trim back the throw bar, which extends past the turnout on either side. I then cut away the side of the head block ties that we're not going to use. And for the other side that we are going to use, those ties are actually too far apart to support a switch stand. So I cut one of the ties off and I move it over so that it can support a switch stand when the time comes. The next step is to drill the hole for the throw wire in the throw bar. Now this is a very delicate piece of plastic, so I start with a number 80 drill and I work my way up to a number 65, which will give me the correct diameter hole for the throw wire that is supplied with the Tam Valley switch machines. My next step is to cut half length rail joiners to be installed at either end of the turnout. This is so they can be slid back and forth and that will allow me to lift the turnout off the layout in the event that it needs to be repaired or replaced. Finally, we have the frog feeder wire, which attaches to a little brass ring on the outside of the turnout. This wire goes down underneath the layout and connects with the frog juicer, and that controls the polarity of the turnout when it is switched back and forth. So this turnout is now ready for installation on the layout. After preparing the turnouts as described, the frog feeder wire is fed through its hole the glue is applied and the turnout is fixed in place. I weight the turnouts while the glue is drying to ensure that they are level and I check to make sure that the throw bar has not been accidentally glued in place and that it can travel back and forth freely. The last image here shows the south switches after installation. It is then on to the main and siding tracks. These are laid on 1 and 1 8 inch centers and their location is marked out with a long steel rule and a quilting ruler. The arrangement is then tested with some lengths of flex track in place and a few freight cars. 
The first image here shows the holes which have been drilled for the feeder wires. Note that I have staggered their location so that they are not all coming into the track bus at the same place. Steel track alignment fixtures are used to ensure straight track. It is pinned in place and it is weighted lightly while the glue dries. The lower photographs show the main and siding tracks after installation. On the left we see the south half and on the right we see the north half. In an earlier segment I mentioned half-length rail joiners and as I approach the joint between benchwork sections at Septimus I'm going to use them again. This is so that in the event this portion of the layout has to be disassembled in the future I can slide the rail joiners back and separate the track without having to cut it. So to make these half-length rail joiners I have a short section of Code 55 rail and Atlas Code 55 rail joiners. The rail joiner goes onto the rail and I will then use needle nose pliers to move the rail joiner down the rail until it is just past the halfway point. I will then take my Xeron track cutters and cut the rail joiner right at the end of the rail. Now that's going to leave a bit of a burr so what I will do is file that away with a track file. Once that's been done, I will then put the rail joiner back in the needle nose pliers and I'm going to move it up and down the rail a few times just to make sure that the burr is gone and the rail joiner can be slid on and off the track. I then pull it off the section of rail and that rail joiner is now ready for use on the layout. So after laying the main track and the siding one and two, this view shows the north switches laid with the frog feeder wires dropped and the throw wire holes drilled below. Note that the track bed is extended out to include the head block ties, same as on the prototype. This photograph shows the portion of the Fort St. John subdivision beyond Septimus, which extends to the end of the benchwork. This section of track is required for locomotives on the Septimus turn to be able to run around their train and pick up the southbound tonnage. This section of track will be able to accommodate three locomotives and a caboose. As originally built, the total run for my Fort St. John subdivision, including Septimus, was about 11 and a half feet. As rebuilt, it will now be approximately 25 feet, which is a significant gain. In addition, the previous version of Septimus could accommodate about 11 cars on each siding track. The new version will be able to handle 14, so we will be able to take a longer train to Septimus, and it will take more time to get there. This is the view as you walk into the bedroom, showing the completed track work for Septimus. And this is another view from across the room. With track work complete, the next step is wiring. A total of 38 feeder wires have been dropped for connection to the track bus, and the auxiliary bus will need to feed the singlet decoders for the turnouts, as well as the fast clock. So there is lots of work to be done underneath this section now. The first step in the wiring was to terminate the various bus wires which had been brought through from the layout room. The auxiliary bus and track bus wires were inserted into a barrier strip and the DCC command bus was plugged into a modular jack. From here, the bus wires will be extended along underneath the benchwork. Due to the narrow benchwork, the command bus will be run along the front wall and the other bus wires will be run along the rear wall so as not to interfere with the installation of the singlets and frog juicers for the turnouts. From the barrier strip, the bus wires are extended along the underside of the benchwork and the feeder wires are connected as I go along. I ran the auxiliary bus first and then run the track bus wires. Two pairs of feeder wires are attached to the auxiliary bus for connection to the singlet decoders for the south switches. These will be installed later. The feeder wires from the track are connected to the track bus wires. They're soldered and covered with heat shrink. Where necessary, a cable clamp is added for strain relief. 
From the track bus, two pairs of feeders are provided for the frog juicers. These will control the polarity for the south switches. Again, these will be installed later. When I get to a bench work joint, such as seen here, the bus wires are fed through the passage holes and then onto the next section. On the other side of the benchwork joint, the bus wires are brought into a barrier strip to provide sectional wiring between the benchwork sections. Here, a branch is taken off the auxiliary bus to power the fast clock, which will be situated above the benchwork. This is accomplished with jumper wires from the track bus to the fast clock leads. Upon reaching the north switches, another two pair of feeder wires are taken off the auxiliary bus to supply the north switch singlets. The auxiliary bus run is then terminated with heat shrink covering the ends. This is to prevent any possibility of shorts. I am about halfway through the wiring process underneath Septimus, and I thought that I would just take a few minutes to talk about it. Here we see the bus wires brought through the benchwork joint and secured to this barrier strip. This is so that in the event the layout has to be dismantled, these wires can be disconnected with the turn of a screw, pulled back through, and then the sections can be separated without having to cut any wires. Up here you can see the auxiliary bus has been run underneath the uh, second section of this benchwork and it's been clamped in place and it's terminated at the far end. Now I am going to run the track bus wires and I, when I do this, I work in one direction. And as I go, I tie in the feeders by wrapping them around an exposed portion of the bus wire. They then get soldered in place. And then I slide heat shrink on from the open end and that uh, covers the joint to prevent any shorts. When we get to the north switches, feeder wires are connected for the frog juicers and singlet decoders. Again, these components will be installed later but we want to install the feeders at this time while we're running the bus. The track bus wires will be terminated at the end of the bench work, but for now I've left them long to facilitate the connection of temporary DC power for testing. This point marks the end of a marathon week of wiring. Much of it was spent on my back with my head under the bench work, so I'm very glad to have it done. This photograph shows the completed bus wiring underneath the south half of Septimus. And here we see the completed bus wiring under the north half. The next wiring project was to install the command bus, which was also brought through from the layout room and it was terminated into a modular jack. From there, a new length of cable is plugged in and extended along the inside front of the benchwork. The data cable is secured in place with flat nylon cable clamps. Now these come with nails which are hammered into place, but that was not going to be possible due to the narrow bench work. So I pulled the nails out and I replaced them with screws. At the bench work joint, the cable is passed through to the next section. The modular plugs require a half inch diameter clearance hole to pass through. On the other side, Another modular jack is installed to provide easy disconnection if required. The cable then continues on underneath the next section of benchwork. The command bus is terminated into the rear of a lens LA152 fascia plate. This has two sockets for modular plugs at the rear. The lens panel has sockets for throttles on the front and it has a status indicator light for the DCC system. This will be handy as we're going to be in a different room from where the layout is. So it's time to connect a DC power pack to the end of the track bus wires so that we can undertake initial testing of the new track work and wiring. Here we have the new bench work for Septimus now installed in the bedroom. You can see the tracks coming through the wall and curving into the south switches at Septimus. We then have the main track, siding one and siding two, running along the bench work, all the way to the north switches. 
And then we have the tail track, which represents the Fort St. John subdivision continuing north to Taylor and Fort St. John. This section of track will accommodate two or three locomotives during a runaround move when a train is here at Septimus. If we come below the benchwork, we will be able to see some of the wiring that has been installed. Along the rear of the benchwork, you can see the auxiliary bus and the track bus with feeders coming in. This wiring here is for the turnouts. There's the green frog feeder and pairs of feeders for the frog juicers and the singlet decoders. I'm deferring installation of those components for now so that I can continue to operate the turnouts manually. Once the auxiliary bus has been powered up, then we'll install those components for remote turnout control. If I come inside here, you can see the grey command bus running along the front of the bench work inside there. And that gets terminated out here at this faceplate, which Lens offers. It has plug-ins for throttles, and it has an indicator light for DCC power. We're going to provide some throttle pockets here. So this section of the layout is new, and it represents a major addition to the layout. My Fort St. John subdivision, including Septimus, will now be about 25 feet long. We'll be able to run longer trains here, and it'll be a bit of a longer run to get here. So now let's get this powered up, and I think it's time to run a test train. Here's the first train on its way to Septimus. We're leaving the Highway 97 section, and we'll be coming along the shelf for the Fort St. John subdivision. This will be one of the last views we get of a train running along here, as this section will shortly be hidden by the Pine River section when it gets installed. And then our train will pass through the wall and into Septimus. And here we have the first train coming into Septimus. This is Work Extra 573, powered by one of my old Atlas RS3s with the Cotto mechanism. It's about 40 years old now. It's pulling two Atlas ballast toppers, which have been custom painted in the PGE map scheme, as well as an Atlas caboose. And there we go, a successful first test run to Septimus. I will now continue testing with trains of revenue freight cars to ensure that they can run back and forth between the layout room and the bedroom without any issues. This photograph shows a 13 car train comprising 40 foot, 50 foot, 60 foot and 85 foot cars arriving in Septimus after a successful transit through the wall. So it has been a very successful month for layout progress and my attention will now turn to final preparations for installing the Pine River and Tremblay sections back in the layout room. I would like to thank my friends Michael, Doug and John who helped with various aspects of the work this month. Thank you for watching and I hope to be back with another update next month. Until then, peace be with you. <laughs>